Okay, welcome everyone again. Um, before I start on the cycles per se, I'll just enumerate those eight points I was going to um, inflict upon you about the, the fifth ray. And I'm just going to read out these, these uh, particular quotes. Um, there's eight or points, I should say. They're just like bullet points, just a few sentences each time. And uh, can we close that back door, please, Jeff? And um, <coughs> the first one, basically, is, is the eight points concerning the fifth ray in science. In some areas, science has exhausted itself. The analytical stage has been accomplished and is ready to start the synthesis stage. Um, point two, before man can move from one extreme, instinct, to the other extreme, intuition, he has to pass through the middle point of the mind, in between extremes, the separative but discriminating mind. Point three, in some ways humanity had to be cut off from its instinctual nature, from the stage of blind belief, and taken to the doubting Thomas stage of, I only believe if I have seen and touched it. Point four, related to orthodox or concrete science, only what is seen, touched and proved is considered a fact or is something real, and thus the concrete scientists build a safe layer or foundation for the esoteric or soul scientist that is emerging at the present stage of human evolution. Point five. Concrete science is the acme of human development. It is the fourfold city, the stable and firm square of the material form, the house that needs to be built and illumined and to be dwelt in by the soul. Point six. The division detachment mentioned above illustrates the great contribution of the concrete scientists and of the fifth ray because analysis is needed before synthesis is possible. Point seven, there is no analysis without synthesis or synthesis without analysis. <coughs> and so the division or separation in between science, proved knowledge, and religion, belief, had to happen before synthesis could be achieved. And point eight, the main axiom of concrete science is there is no criteria of truth without experimentation and this is what took humanity out of the dark age, forced it to open the eye and has brought it to the present stage of synthesis, a synthesis with a higher level of consciousness. So, is there any comments on that? I'll welcome them now before I move on to the next section on cycles. I think it's very self-explanatory. So, uh, now, I think, you know, the statements I made this morning about the fifth ray and the third ray bringing the fifth root race or third root race, esoterically counting, the fifth root race is the third actual human root race, uh, is profound. And the third ray cycle we find ourselves in at the moment is the one that started in 1425, about the time of the European Renaissance. And it goes through to 2325. It has a 900-year outgoing cycle. No, no, hang on, it's got a 350-year outgoing cycle. 450 years, I beg your pardon. Hang on, I can't count here. 450 years, yeah. And a 450-year incoming cycle. So it's a 900-year cycle. That doesn't mean to say that all third ray cycles are 900 years all the rays have different duration cycles. You can have a 7,000 year cycle for the seventh ray and also a 2,500 year cycle. There are 500 and 2,500 year cycles for the second ray. So uh, that's well beyond my ken in terms of the, the harmonic harmonics of these particular cycles, but it's absolutely intriguing, of course. So the cycles, the cycles I'm working with here, the ones that have been given by DK, and so this particular one of 1425 for the third ray, the third ray of active intelligence, gave rise to the great efflorescence of, of art and sciences starting in 1425 and going right through to present day. It reached its peak in 1875, which is interesting because this is when Blavatsky uh, published the uh, Isis Unveiled, about uh, several years before 1888 when she published The Secret Doctrine. So that 1875 date is, is quite uh, interesting because in one sense Blavatsky's teachings, even though they are of a first ray, first aspect nature, they are also of the third aspect or third ray nature in that 
that came first, the second aspect DK teachings came second, and the first aspect teachings that we're expecting uh, will be the last. Um, <coughs> okay, so... Now, I'll just come back to another diagram that you may not have got a chance to completely absorb this morning, or for those who weren't here this morning. Um, we have the 333, the 444, the 555, which represents the culminations and the, um, the crises of each root race. 333 is the start of, of, um, of individualization, but it ended in 3.5, or the fifth sub race of the third root race, about 3 million years later. 444 represents the great conflict in the middle of Atlantis when um, you know, there's a huge war, it was followed by a huge flood, the first Atlantean flood, around about four million years ago. And the 555 represents pretty much now the, the um, quintessential expression of the fifth root race. And these three periods are also what I qualify as the three Shambhala impacts in my book called The Shambhala Impacts where releases of, sham of energy from Shambhala, or the first ray, um, uh, impacted the planet, mostly destructively for the first three, which took place over 20-odd million years, and less destructively over the last um, less than 100 years. We've had the last two. We've had five Shambhala impacts. The 1945, where the dropping of the bomb was the third one. The 1975 was the fourth one, and 2000 was the fifth one. Uh, we'll go more into this 1945 third Shambhala impact uh, soon um, because it ties in very much with the, the dweller for the fifth root race, the, the, the crisis. The World War I and II was humanity facing its dweller and the various nations played their part out in that, the various nations of the fifth root race particularly. Um, <coughs> so... Uh, Enough said there. Any questions? It's pretty clear. Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, so we'll tell us about 2000, this, the current time uh, calculated. Oh, that's just an arbitrary date as a rounding off figure to work from. Uh, with some of the figures DK and Blavatsky has given uh, in my books, I've actually used 2000 as an as a, as a arbitrary date that's a round figure that we can all relate to. Um, so it's pretty much now. In the greater scheme of things, it's like 12 years difference from where we are now. I think I coined that back in 2000, actually. But, um, so, so the third ray is the mother ray. It gives birth to the fourth, fifth, and sixth and seventh rays. And of course, the ray five and ray seven are on the odd ray line of ray three, the rays of mind. Um, so the fifth ray cycle from 1775 to the 1990s that I described this morning was the really specific technological inventions and, and, and innovations that were brought about um, from about that time, um, probably the early 1700s, but it really picked up around 1775. Um, and of course, this was also the discovery of Uranus. So the Uranian seventh ray energy was uh, working with the fifth ray for sure. Both the fifth ray and the seventh rays are great um, um, uh, manifestors. Uh, the great, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, uh, um, what was that? Well, collaborators, yeah, there's another word <laughs> I was trying to find, but come back to me. Um, and of course, uh, there was a seventh ray, uh, seventh ray cycle that started in 1675. Um, but there was also another one that started in, in 1945 that I talk about in, in one of my books. And you'll find that essay on the web too. Um, so they were most complementary to each other. Obviously the masters could see what was going on in terms of just all rays of mind. Now this is what produced the Nazi, pretty much. And I talk about this in my essay on the Nazis in my Destiny of the Nations book, Volume 1, um, about how they just starved out the feeling nature completely and just used the, the power of the first, third, fifth, and seventh rays to, to you know, they were like, um, like yogis in a sense, some of them, uh, in terms of being able to really manipulate. 
So, um, as I said this morning, the, the, the fifth ray that was started up in 1775 was withdrawn by a special and unique arrangement between Sanat Kamara and the Lord of the Fifth Ray. That was a mind-boggling statement for me because it just conjured up this vision of, well, do they meet in the halls of Shambhala? Do they have a cup of tea with each other or what? You know, obviously these beings are at a very high level. Um, because it was deemed that, uh, here's a quote here from DK, the needed special impulse has been adequate and that the impetus given to the human spirit of discovery has served its purpose. Any further intensification of the mental processes just now, except through the per general pervasive effect of the third ray, might prove disastrous. So we have, they have really sailed very close to the wind with, the, with using this fifth ray energy, which was needed to speed things up, but which had so many disastrous side effects. Um, so the third and fifth rays brought the fifth or the third root race to perfection through science. Science played a huge part in that from, from the Renaissance period all the way through, but particularly, of course, the last 200 years. From the, um, we have the invention of, the, of, of uh, transport trains, uh, automobiles, um, aeroplanes, um, you know, um, spinning mills, um, publishing, printing. There is just uh, thousands, literally thousands of things that we can name. That you know, this whole room here is run by scientific inventions: cameras, sound system, lights, everything. You know, uh, when was the light bulb invented? Invented about 18, 1880s or something? Yeah. Yeah, so before that, they had gas lights or gas lamps, candles, and so forth. I mean, this is revolutionary, and also, of course, a very special symbol of the light and illumination of the third ray, and that pe people could stay awake longer at night time and read books and uh, more easily and all that kind of stuff. Now, and the major distinction to make about these scientific inventions that, that have been created in the last 200 years is that humanity invented them themselves. We had all these advanced technologies back in Atlantis, but they were God-given gifts by the guides of the race to humanity. They, they were like children, in a sense, who had been given gifts and had them taken away from them when, when some of them were abused. And so humanity now, through its own mental development, has, is starting to uncover some of those, those old gifts and, uh, excuse me, those old um, yeah, gifts and inventions from Atlantean times, but through their own mental power, uh, not, you know, they may have intuited something from the abstract planes, of course, like, like many inventors and scientists do, but it's purely of their own volition. They're not, they're not being given something on a plate like it was given to them in Atlantean times. So this is a very important distinction, and it represents the triumph, in many ways, of the fifth root race and, the, and of mental development. But of course, we're not really out of the woods yet in terms of the dangers and side effects of the fifth ray and, and what that can create. <coughs> now, we, the fifth ray cycle has finished, but we're going into the age of Aquarius on the lesser wheel and the greater wheel, and the fifth ray is the only ray given as coming through Aquarius. So even though we may not be in a, ray, in a Ray 5 cycle now, or maybe a long way down the track, we are going to be invoking the fifth ray energy by virtue of the fact that the Aquarian um, energy is there. Uh, and as DK said, it will be probably more via the third ray for safety until we get to a point of mental control where the fifth ray energy will be released maybe a couple of thousand years or several hundred years further down the track when we can handle it a little bit better. Of course, the fifth ray is intimately related to the first ray, uh, the first ray of will or power, and, and that's out of incarnation at the moment, although in the last couple of hundred years it was invoked very strongly, as I'll talk about in a minute. So, the fifth ray, a couple of statements here about the fifth ray. The fifth ray prevents humanity reverting to the more astral sixth ray. Bear in mind that all this scientific development happened at the end of the age of Pisces, the age of religion, belief, mysticism, uh, romanticism, the feeling nature, and so forth. 
Um, two, the fifth ray saves humanity from its instinctive feeling nature, keeping it closer to the human and soul kingdom instead of the animal kingdom. And three, the fifth ray detaches humanity from unconscious knowing or belief and takes it to direct knowledge or to the knowledge of the soul. So, during the fifth ray period from the 1700s to the 1800s, um, uh, just to adjust this a minute, um, we find that a lot of hitherto accepted cultural uh, beliefs uh, disappeared. For instance, the knowledge and understanding of the diva or the fairy kingdom. You could go somewhere in Wales or Ireland back in the 1600s or 1700s and back then in those times fairies and divas were very common in terms of people being able to see them or if you like the fairies and divas actually made themselves visible to people. In those particular countries though the the, as Scotland, Ireland, Wales, the Celtic kind of um, uh, background, they have the what they call the second sight. Many people have the second sight, um, which is a is a, just a, 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 an astral psychism, I guess. But nevertheless, they could see fairies and divas, and, and they, these fairies and divas, uh, some of them quite advanced ones by the sounds of the stories I read, made themselves visible to people. But with the clamour and the noise and the pollution of the industrial age, these divas receded back from the cities and, and you know, uh, went out to the country, if you like. Um, obviously, you know, trees and flowers and so forth still grow in cities and there are divas required to do that. But um, some of these divas that, uh, you know, that uh, had played this role previously found themselves retreating. Likewise, uh, astrology, you know, with Queen Elizabeth I and, and uh, many monarchies in Europe and so forth that had been so much to the fore and you, know, you had a court astrologer and, and so forth, that parted company uh, with uh, being recognised as, it was recognised as something that was like fortune telling. And fair enough, it probably was, with the way it was being used or abused by some, some practitioners. Um, I, and... Um, it probably degenerated in some respect, even though there may have been plenty of bona fide astrologers out there. But that gradually became a, a, an unacceptable um, thing. So, it, and it still is today, even though astrology has really evolved uh, to a much higher point than what it was in the last few hundred years. It's really there's really been quite an astrological revolution alongside all these other revolutions. Um, but it still is not. Uh, recognised because of the glamour of authority of modern science, who immediately dismiss astrology every time they hear about it, you know, especially astronomers and so forth. So um, again, it comes down to this impasse between exoteric science and esoteric science of recognising the subtle realms, if you like, and, 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 and activating that sixth sense, the, uh, the, uh, the intuition. So, in the age of Aquarius, uh, and I should have mentioned this this morning, although it may have been obvious, um, the two sciences will reunite. You know, astrology will reassume its natural place as a bona fide science and, and will eventually, who knows, um, uh, work very closely with astronomy. Somewhere, maybe thousands of years down the track, maybe, but uh, there's a very good chance of it happening in Aquarius because of the fifth and seventh ray energies that are involved with Aquarius. Uh, you know, uh, Uranus is intimately related to astrology and cycles. Um, and of course, uh, the Aquarian age has a lot to do with uh, us developing a greater awareness of the Diva Kingdom. You know, places like uh, Findhorn and Perilandra and so forth that were communities uh, based uh, originally on, on um, working with the Divas consciously uh, are the first few seeds of what we're going to see uh, further on down the track. Now, of course, the, uh, again, the concrete mind of most of Britain and, and the world rejected um, the divas or the fairy realm and, and the marvellous things that were going on at Finhorn, um, but that seed has been sown. Uh, and and it, will, it will find another cycle where uh, it will uh, re-emerge. And likewise with crop circles, you know, all these things have been explained away by the concrete mind. 
you know, oh, it's a lovely pattern, you know, in the front page of the Telegraph. Uh, but, you know, Doug and Dave did it after the pub with, after they had a few beers. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, is he? Okay. Yes. Yeah, rest his soul. Um, <clears throat> so, during this time of, of the, uh, these race cycles, um, you know, the seventh race cycle, the third race cycle, the fifth race cycle. There was also a couple of second race cycles. There was the second race cycle in 1575, um, and I talk about that in my uh, first Test in the Nations book. Um, and I'm not sure actually how long that went for, maybe 500 years. Um, but the second race cycles are very, you know, they're, they're there all the time in many ways. And if you consider the fact that we are a second race solar system, and that stands to reason. Um, another second race cycle was in 1825, and I think that was a sub-cycle of the Greater Ray 6 cycle that was going at the time. I'm not sure. But nevertheless, um, the masters were very concerned about um, the uh, extraordinary uh, developments that were happening with the Industrial Revolution. The, I mean, the, the din and the noise for a start, you know, the pollution, um, and what that must have done to the etheric body of the Earth. You know, we, we've been told that the atom bomb itself uh, tore, tore a wrench in the veil of the etheric of the Earth, uh, ultimately in, in uh, World War II. But all those, those um, factors had an extraordinary effect, and we had children working in coal mines, you know, and, and all the, the grossness of the industrial age, you know, a child slave labor, um, robber barons, uh, industrial um, mega giants who were just uh, robbing the people blind and make it for more profits and all the rest of it. Um, and of course, as I mentioned this morning, Charles Dickens came forth in the midst of that and I, cl I put him in the category of the romantic poets uh, because his stories are just so beautiful um, and so full of compassion and um, yet and, and of course his works are as enduring as Shakespeare's works, but, um, uh, and it must, must have made a bit of a dent at the time, but um, overall the masters regarded the romantic poets and, and, so, and so forth who came in to try and offset the, the excesses of the age as a failure. And it's a really sobering thing to read. It really makes, makes you stop and, and reflect upon that. <coughs> Um, and then, of course, we have William Blake, the Dark Satanic Mills. Now, during the Industrial Revolution, um, some of the major nations involved with this were Germany and, and Britain, both first-rate personalities. Germany, a fourth-rate soul, um, Britain, a second-rate soul. And those countries were... were, were I don't exactly know the right figures, um, but I would say m uh, the majority of heavy industry in Europe was centred in those countries. Uh, the, is it, was it the Ruhr, the Ruhr or Ruhr Valley in Germany? And, um, and of course Britain. And, and all the inventions that came from those countries, particularly Britain, there's an extraordinary amount of inventions. You know, the, the, the spinning jenny was inv invented in Britain. Um, perhaps the, the, rail, the railway... Um, engine and, and so forth. Um, so think Industrial Revolution, think Vulcan at the forge, or Vulcan and his co-workers, as depicted here by the Master Serapis in one of his previous incarnations as, as Paul Veronese. Um, and there they are, wielding their hammers around the anvil. And um, and so uh, it's interesting to note that these two countries, Germany and Britain, are what we call Anglo-Saxon. Saxon, Germany, Anglo, Britain. And Anglo-Saxon is the predominant quality of the fifth branch race, which I talk about as the, the branch race that is culminating the fifth sub-race that is culminating the fifth root race. 
and we're not quite finished that. We've got about 10,000 years to go, I calculate, for that branch race. And, but I think the majority of it, the, of the work to be done in the, excuse me, the fifth branch race is going to be in this next 2,000 year cycle. Um, and which has the influence of the, of the lesser cycle of, of Aquarius and the greater cycle. I'm going to go into this a bit more later. So, and then after a couple of hundred years of this, um, uh, of this uh, intense industry all over Europe, we have these two countries facing off against one another in World War II as one of the major countries of the Allied powers, Britain, and one of the major countries of the Axis power, uh, Germany, who, who started it. <laughs> and um, there you have, if you like, the dweller of the fifth branch race. The two major countries involved in that branch race are actually um, facing the dweller. They're facing one another and fighting it out. And it really was a battle for the soul of humanity, that war. World War I and II, of course, regarded esoterically as one war. But um, very interesting to consider it in this light. And of course, uh, Britain is a second-ray soul, first-ray personality, but London, its capital, is a fifth-ray soul and a seventh-ray personality. This is very interesting, a fifth-ray soul. Well, it figures for the leading nation of the fifth root race, the fifth race soul for London actually does, does make some sense. Um, and the seventh ray, which has to do with geometrical archetypes, is, uh, is appropriate as well in terms of the um, crop circles that happen all around London, you know, around, particularly in the southwest. I think you can see the aura of London extending far beyond the actual um, M25, that is the circular road that goes around it. So um, that's something that, uh, that requires more investigation and more, more reflection, of course. But um, anyway, um, now World War II culminated with the third Shambhala impact in 20 million years and um, with the dropping of the nuclear bomb. And if that hadn't have happened, the Germans may have, may have actually, you know, may have won the race in developing the bomb, um, and humanity could have been enslaved for the next 1,000 years. So, and of course, DK calls it, uh, dare I say, uh, on streaming, <laughs> one of the greatest spiritual events in, in human history. So, you know, we tend to see things where the destruction of the form is not a spiritual thing, you know. Um, but, of course, there's a lot more behind this and we don't really have the time to explore this today. Nevertheless, what I'm getting to here is the acceleration of the development of sciences. The war speeded up tenfold from the previous 200 years. You know, there were so many inventions that came out in World War II particularly, and it was probably the first war that was ever fought out where the enemy was trying to find out what the excuse me, one side was trying to find out what the enemy was developing and to try and stop what they were developing. You know, there was the heavy water project up there in Norway by the Germans and all sorts of other things, the V2 project. Um, they, they had so many projects on the boil at the time in, in all, and all the best scientists, scientific minds of Germany working and Britain and other nations working on this stuff. It's extraordinary. I mean, you could really just make uh, a documentary just simply about that, all those particular sciences. What was that other one with the, the big circular thing that they built? Um, does anyone know? The Bell, ex Bell experiment? Yeah. That's extraordinary, you know. The, um, and, um, and of course, Hitler was sending off, off parties of, of uh, explorers to try and find Shambhala and uh, you know, the Spear of Destiny and all the rest of it. So it, it was really on and they were, they were just trying to cover everything in their quest for domination and power. Um, but in World War II, this greater acceleration of science occurred in weaponry, logistical support, communications, intelligence, medicine and industry. And there were many things that were invented then that we're still using today, of course. Um, ultimately it produced the nuclear bomb that ended the war. A scientific invention ended World War II. Um, 
and we have been living in an uneasy relationship ever since with the bomb, so much so that it is the number one security issue on the planet today. Um, yet, of course, DK reminds us that um, many people passed onto the path of initiation during World War II. People took initiation. There was a great outpouring of compassion. The love-wisdom aspect was actually uh, forced out of humanity through the intense pain and conflict of both wars. Um, <clears throat> now, let me just go to... So, just to... Um, someone was asking me a question before about David was. What was the question again? It was about the seventh ray or Uranus thing that I put in somewhere. Oh, okay. Well, you might remember as we go through here. Uh, let's just recap just quickly. European Renaissance, uh, 1425 to the 1700s, um, ray three active intelligence, rapid intellectual development, uh, the Age of Enlightenment, 1650 to 1700, a cultural movement of intellectuals to reform society, advance knowledge, promote science, and intellectual interchange uh, who are opposed to intolerance, superstition, and the abuses of church and state. And this is where astrology started to, to become, uh, of course, um, uh, not tolerated. Ray 3, active intelligence, still there. Ray 2 of Love Wisdom, 1575. Ray 7, Ceremonial Order, 1675. And it was an intellectual flowering. But as Michael pointed out this morning, um, the, the reason of... Uh, the reason, uh, reason or reasoning of Descartes and, and, and all the rest of them at that time wasn't really the true uh, uh, intuitive reason of the, the higher um, Buddhic plane. Oh, cool. okay, yes. Um, is it on, the mic's not on? Okay. No. Try again. Just keep tapping it, Mike. There, David. No. 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 Still not on. Let me repeat the question for you. Just to tell me what, and I'll repeat it. Now, you, you say the question and I'll repeat it. The concept of conclaves. Concept of conclaves, yeah. We're talking about the different periods here with you, and I'd like to try about a conclave where I guess there was each sentence. There was one in 1425. DK does mention that. Well, I guess the relationship between the conclaves and the periods is that the, I mean, the masters do have a, a, a once, once every century conclave, I think, on the, the 25th year of the century. Uh, so there's one in 2000, uh, excuse me, there's one in 1925, and there'll be one in 2025 and so forth. And there's one in 1425, but I'm sure they have, you know, they tie in with uh, some of the ray cycles as well. They might have special ones that we don't even know about. Um, what was the other one that they have? They have the 49-year cycle one of initiation of decision, which I have an essay about in one of my books. Um, one in 1903, one in 1952, and one in 2001. Three months, uh, three weeks after 9-11. That would have, I worked out it would have occurred in October because that's the sign of decision. I'm not sure. Nicholas might know. We have to answer that one for you. Did 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 she? Vlaski or one of her followers? Okay. Yeah. Okay. So so just for for the tape, yes. <laughs> Um, there's another one that DK talks about in the first first ten years of every century, isn't it? Um, I'm sorry, I'm not I'm not uh, recalling too well on that one. Anyway, I'll just finish this um, table. Um, Industrial Revolution changes in agriculture, manufacturing, mining, transportation, technology. Profound effect, obviously, on the social, economic, and cultural conditions. Uh, of course, Uranus is discovered amidst all that. Um, Ray 3, 5, and 1, 1 indirectly, not necessarily a Ray 1 cycle that I'm aware of. 
and technology revolution, also called the Second Industrial Revolution from the latter half of the 19th century until World War I, culminated in mass production and the production line, um, Ray 3, Ray 5. And yeah, Michael or somebody mentioned the other day the 1950s onwards communications revolution after World War II. So that sort of comes in within technology and industrial and digital revolutions. 1975 is the, is the fourth Shambhala impact and the start of the digital revolution. It was the start of the internet, the very basic internet at the time uh, at some of the universities here in the States. Um, and obviously that's going to just keep on going. Uh, okay. Now, I'll just put a pretty picture back up here. Let's go back to the first one. <coughs> okay. Now, just coming back to a few more specifics about the 1781 discovery of Uranus. Um, leading up to that date, of course, there was the American Revolution and the Declaration of Independence. And just after, the, and of course the people involved in that were actually going to France quite regularly and seeing the revolution for France, which occurred after the discovery of Uranus. So it's quite a profound period, and I have many essays about that in my books and on my website. Um, so the fifth and seventh rays were in manifestation, and I'm looking at this 1675 to 1775 period, 1675 being the seventh ray cycle beginning, 1775 being the fifth ray cycle, as the start of the cusp of the age of, of Pisces and Aquarius. And the cusp for a 2,160 year cycle like this is about 500 years. Um, some people say later, so forth, but, but this is pretty much the cusp of the cycle, particularly as the two rays involved are intimately associated with Aquarius. Um, and DK gives about a 500 years cuspal period for that. So that would take it up to about 2075, um, depending on which year that you use, or 2175 for the start of the Aquarian age. DK gives another figure, 2117, which is the technical astronomical time of the precession of the Sun into Aquarius. So that happens within that cuspal period anyway. So we're, we're really going to be up and running in the Aquarian age by, by that time, I think. And um, cuspal, no cusp. There'll be quite a critical mass of people that will be responding to the Aquarian forces coming in uh, at that time. As opposed to now, it's not so much, but it'll, I think it'll really accelerate in the next 100 years or so. So Uranus, of course, is connected to science and revolution. Um, and this Aquarian cycle is a double cycle, just to reiterate, of the 2160 with a 25,000 year cycle. And he talked about the 25,000 year cycle being the greater wheel. I think that what the Mayans are talking about with 2012 is actually the start, astronomically at least, of the, of the 25,000 year cycle. I have an essay about that on my website and my books um, that, that goes into more detail. But just to mention that in passing, um, that there's this huge 25,000 year cycle that's occurring and, and DK tells us that it's a time of unprecedented opportunity where um, it's only occurred for the seventh time in the history of the fifth root race. I'm not sure whether he means the entire four million year period or just the one million year period. I've never really discovered which, but suffice to say, with the seventh ray, there, there is going to be a bringing of the kingdom of souls onto, on, on, onto earth, into manifestation. That, that, that's the great um, gift of the Aquarian age. We have Jupiter, the ruler of the second ray of love wisdom, as the sole ruler of Aquarius. So the water bearer, and the invocation of that second ray of love, wisdom, energy, and its manifestation on the physical plane is the greatest promise that the Aquarian Age holds for us. And, but we are at the, the uh, cusp of this age, and 
we are facing many dangers and things that we actually haven't finished and got right yet uh, for us to, to embrace that period somewhere down the track. <clears throat> yeah. Can you just elaborate what you meant by the one million year period and the four mm. million year period? As sure. to the seventh I'll time of Aquarius? Yeah. If we go back to this diagram, this table, we have um, four million years ago, or 3.8 was it 3.89 something exactly, but I'm rounding off to 4 million, um, was what I, the, the time that I identified through working through the yugas backward, but also working th with some of Blavatsky's figures from individualization forward, and they both prove each other quite well, as the time of the war in Atlantis and where the Mahabharata story was, was enacted and, and there was a huge conflict and millions of people were, were killed in that war. There were millions of people in the, those armies. And this was the time of Arjuna, Krishna, uh, Yudhisthira, the king of, of India at that time. And, um, but all these names are also symbols for cycles and, and nations and all sorts of stuff. It's, it's intricately, intric intricately um, uh, depicted in the Puranas and, and uh, the Indian texts. And so at this time, the, the war was between the, the um, graduating initiates, if you like, or the flower of the Atlantean race who had developed mind because the Atlantean race was mainly astrally polarized. And so this created a cleavage. But the other cleavage came from the fact that the God-given gifts that had been given to humanity were being abused and materialism and black magic was right. And so the masses had to decide to, uh, to tell humanity, this is the way of light, this is the way of materialism. And in that decision that they made, that, precipita that forced a precipitation of the war between um, you know, the, the family of the, the Pandu brothers and the Karabas, um, who were symbolically all of the sub-races of Atlantis and so forth. And, and so... I'm, I'm getting to answer your question, but I have to give you this background. Um, so those initiates and disciples of the Atlantean race were the seeds of the new fifth root race that was emerging, that was about to emerge. And, and, the, and so the schism, the conflict, was between the very astrally polarised Atlanteans who wanted everything you know, uh, and the ones who had the higher, higher values. And um, so when the great flood came not long after the end of the war that wiped millions of people off the face of the planet and actually covered most of the planet so that, that only the mountaintops were actually visible and the survivors who survived found their way to the mountaintops, um, Noah, or the, the, the Vaivasvata Manu, uh, went round rescuing, literally rescuing in, in the ark. But the ark is a symbolic thing, but it's also a literal thing, I think. Uh, and the animals going on two by two are all the, the skerricks and remnants of the, of the sub races and root races and so forth. And he took the survivors of the flood from all around the globe, apparently, and this, this story is told in Peruvian myths, in, in Bolivia, in, all over the world, in many different cultures, you'll find this, this Noah character uh, you know, as in Noah's Ark, um, called by different names, but it's exactly the same story. Um, took them to a place in the Himalayas where he pretty much started to, to breed a new race, which was a synthesis of all the remnants of humanity at that time, maybe even some Lemurian sub-races, who knows. And he created over a period of about three million years, um, like an incubation period of this, these races being separated from the, from the rest of, of the world um, uh, in the Himalayas. And when the time was right, about a million years ago, the new fifth root race, the, the Aryan race, the, which is an old Hindu word, um, precipitated down into, into India 
and became the first sub-race of the fifth root race. So the, the, the true manifestation of the physical forms, Nicholas, is about a million years ago as far as I understand. The, the nascent sort of development before that was about three million years, which is an extraordinarily long period. Of course, there are people in the rest of the world, at, other Atlantean survivors and so forth, getting on with their lives and all the rest of it. Um, in fact, I date the, the, the next big war, the Ramayana uh, story, is around about um, one and a half million years ago. And that, that's a very juicy area of exploration and, and hints about, about uh, esoteric history. Okay, Any, anyone else? Uh, as we know, the master Moria will be the Manu for the sixth root race. Well, he'll be the next Manu, but I'm not sure whether it's going to be for the sixth root race because I'm not sure whether the office is going to go for that long. But anyway, right. go on. My question is, do you think there will be a similar kind of incubation process for t t to create the sixth root race? Will a Manu need to take certain human beings to a certain place in the world, mm. isolate them for a given amount of time to essentially, you know, mm. be create the seed to become the sixth root race. Yes, well there's two parts to, to, to my answer here. The first part is that it is rumoured that that's actually happening already. There are isolated communities up in the Andes and, 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 and the stories range from the very glamorous and deluded to, to feasible. Um, people who have been specially chosen for their, for their intuitive qualities uh, and for their obviously their soul evolution and that may be going on for all we know. How do we know it's not? Right. Um, and this has been talked about in various books. And the, the second part of the question is that it's happening already anyway. South America has been since, particularly since World War II, has been populated quite intensely by Europeans. And this synthesis of the, of the races is occurring already and will continue to do so over the next 5,000 years. Mm -hmm. Did I answer your question? Yes. Okay. Um, uh, we, have, we have a lot of Japanese in South America, Eastern races. We have uh, a lot of Germans, of course. Um, uh, you name it, everyone, everyone in Europe is represented there and plenty of Americans too. South, I mean, North Americans. Um, now, one thing I m tried to emphasize today, and I don't know whether I explained it very well, was the fact that in order for the fifth root race to succeed, um, there's a certain critical mass of initiates that need to take the third degree initiation. And these are people from all walks of life. They're not just esotericists. <laughs> um, and, and for this to happen, I, I figure that this is going to happen in the first decanate of Aquarius um, because Saturn rules the first decanate and it also rules the third ray and it also is connected to the third, third initiation. Um, and that the anchoring and the taking of that third initiation will put the, the planet in a place of safety. At the moment, I don't think we're quite there yet. Place of safety in terms of this, this station of light that, that DK talks about that is established on the planet that will create a... Um, a safety net or a, not a safety net, but a um, uh, almost a permanent um, protection against the forces of materialism. But right now, we are engaged in the worst kind of conflict about materialism. We've sunk deeper into materialism since World War II in many ways. And World War II was designed, if you like, <laughs> Um, the, the purpose of World War II or the, for its manifestation was to address the materialism of the industrial age in the last 200 years before that. So even though many good things have happened uh, uh, since that time and there, is, there seems to be or at least there's a greater awareness of, uh, of an outpouring of compassion from humanity, the recent disasters of the last 20 years attest to this, as soon as it happens in Japan with a tsunami, we know about it almost live now. And, um, and so there was a response by the rest of the world, and this is very encouraging, of course. So it's very hard to get a handle on what is actually happening subjectively because 
um, uh, you know, we, you can only measure these things by statistics. Statistics is a very interesting third-ray science, by the way, because we can actually really, you know, measure uh, what's going on. Uh, so we are in the age of Cap uh, we are in, in a cycle now of Pluto and Capricorn. Pluto is a 250-year cycle. It was last in Capricorn on the lead-up to the. Uh, um, you know, well, during the War of Independence and, and also the Declaration of Independence. Um, so um, in the 1770s and so forth. So America, USA, is going through its first Pluto return, that means once around the circle, since it's been created. Pluto entered Capricorn a few years ago and it gets to the natal position, I think, around about 2020 maybe less, um, and you know the whole, back before the um, Declaration of Independence, the whole issue with Pluto and Capricorn was with the mother country and about money. And Capricorn has a lot to do with the making of money and, and, and management of resources. And of course Pluto is, is related to power and money is power. So a lot of the economic woes that we've been experiencing in the last 10 years uh, are, is related to Pluto and Capricorn worldwide, not just USA. But um, of course, um, as I've said in other lectures and in other writings and so forth, I believe that this period of Pluto and Capricorn is going to cast the dice one way or the other as to whether humanity is going to be successful in confronting its dweller because at the moment the dweller has the world in a stranglehold and particularly the US. So, um, uh, you know, it's, it's up to humanity to make this decision and to, and to find its way out of this mess. Um, let's see now. Um, in Aquarius, altruism will become stronger, love and mind or science will blend. Inventions will increase for human well-being and of course as someone was saying today will free us up to, to get on with the really important things of life, you know, the, of, of spiritual ethics and philosophy and so forth. Um, nations like France have a fifth ray soul and France has been given uh, the, um, the task of actually proving the existence of the human soul and whether that happens or not, somewhere down the track, but a fifth raised soul nation would certainly uh, uh, be, uh, be a good one to pick for that, that sort of discovery. I mentioned London as a fifth raised soul. Um, and of course the, the fifth ray Venus um, uh, is the planet that the Mayans based all their particular cycles upon. Um, and the mines all but disappeared, the, the ancient mines, I'm not talking about the modern remnants, um, were a sub-race of the fifth root race uh, around about 800,000 800, years ago, not, not just a few thousand years ago. Um, and um, as I also have mentioned in other talks, the, the, the popular awareness of the Mayans and the Mayan calendar in 2012 and so forth relates to a bridging um, of consciousness between the previous fifth root race and the coming in, in North America represented by the synthesis of, of, of races in North America and the new sixth root race that is taking seed in South America. Guatemala was the, and Honduras in those places was the, was the main um, uh, abode of the, of the Mayans and so that bridge of that little neck of land between North and South America and the Mayans themselves represent that bridge to that new consciousness. Um, and although they were a race that was Atlantean in many ways and bridged, f they, they were a bridge between the Atlantean race and the fifth root race, but Blavatsky specifically says they, that they are particularly of the fifth root race, fifth root race consciousness, that they had a lot of the, those Venusian sciences of magic and architecture as the Egyptians did who were basically a, uh, a related tribe, both of them coming from a now sunken part of India. 
you can find that information in my, my other writings. So any other comments or questions? We've got plenty of time left to discuss. Yeah. Um, microphone. Can you just say a few words about the UN? Um, you said, I know you mentioned the uh, third ray statistics being very third ray, oh. and I know the UN is full of statistics. Is it? <laughs> <laughs> well. But um, it may be in regard to the hope for whatever in relation to this. Well, you, the UN is certainly the hope of the world because it has to do with nations cooperating rather than competing for resources and eventually the UN will be managing world resources um, which is a great idea but many countries wouldn't be ready for that by a long shot. <laughs> and the UN is only a young entity. It was born out of World War II. It was born in 1945, the same year as the bomb dropped. Um, and I discuss the two different charts for that somewhere. and. Um, uh, they're only, what, 60-something 60, 60 years old. So um, it will, because it's a synthesis of all the nations, there's a lot of integrating to go on in terms of the UN's personality, whatever that personality ray may be or astrological uh, quality. Um, and so it gets, up, gets caught up in endless talk fests and and, uh, and, so, and all these various factions and internal politics that you, all the stories you hear about. So this is, this is only natural for any entity's integration. We can't expect too much too soon, although, you know, I certainly do. Um, and um, it has a lot of um, unfortunate uh, corruption as well, uh, internally and also nations externally, such as the US, unduly influencing or you know, holding, holding them to, uh, to, to um, blackmail, if you like. So um, I, I'm optimistic, of course, but it's going to take a, a, a while. I think it's something like the UN problem at the moment certainly needs to be sorted out during this Pluto and Capricorn time. Pluto and Capricorn will bring all these corruptions and, and uh, hidden agendas to the surface to be dealt with. Um, I think I've said in other talks that I believe um, that so many of humanity are so recalcitrant in their old ways of doing things, of working with money, um, of doing business, um, of politics, that things are so entrenched that the only way I can see of things actually changing is, is major natural cataclysms. <laughs> you know, humanity dragged kicking and screaming without it, with, with not much free will to uh, a place where they are forced to change the way things are done. Yes, Francis. Uh, DK offers a, a possible other solution that comes from an unexpected place. He, he doesn't offer it, he hints at it. And, and that's, you know, we've had every kind of government, you know, uh, uh, benevolent uh, dictatorships um, to, um, brief actual democracies. What we haven't had is a cor corporatocracy, and that's what we're actually mm. moving towards now. I mean, when the Supreme Court allowed the corporation to become an individual, yes. um, it it was maybe you know the most important decision uh, made of this decade because it leads the way to the potential of a corporatocracy, which sounds like, you know, horror upon horror. Yes. But DK also says that um, there's a lot in the way that corporations move that uh, mirrors the way an initiate moves. It's, um, and if all that has to change is motive. And it exactly. occurs to me that if a corporation actually comes into charge and they realize that they're in total control and they look at the um, what is left of the uh, natural resources mm. and then realize that they must um, shepherd them, mm. that that possibly is another way. 
Absolutely. And I do discuss this in my two, two newsletters for last year for Libra and Scorpio. Um, I talk about the, the, the corporate domination and the fact that they too, like the UN, are young integrating entities. So the first thing is like a young child who wants, that's mine, you know. And it's the selfish aspect of corporations just going for record profits regardless of employees or, or, res uh, or pollution or whatever. Um, but of course, not all corporations are like that today. There are quite a few very responsible ones. And, and corporate work is something that's never happened in the history of humanity, in a sense, in recent history anyway. We've had these cartels and organizations and so forth who have dominated business. But we haven't had massive corporations with thousands of people as who are employees of a corporation. These are huge entities. And this is part of the Aquarian age because the Aquarian age is the age of group work and group processes. So it's only natural we're going to get these um, unintegrated corporate entities that, um, that are, are going to express selfishly and that will gradually change. And there's more and more corporate responsibility that you read about and uh, can, can see every day in, in various articles and so forth, which is very encouraging. Um, some of them just pay lip service, you know, wear green and all that kind of stuff. Or, you know, but, but a lot more of them are doing more profit sharing with employees and uh, making sure everyone's taken care of, the environment's being looked after and all the rest. So that, that is encouraging and it's probably part of the plan. You know, uh, I can't, it, it's, it's greater, it's engendering greater cooperation amongst humanity and, and that's what we have to sort out, you know, get this science of right relationships working because the science of right relationships is one of the main sciences that the age of Aquarius is offering us to, um, to get right. Yes, Kathy. <coughs> Um, in terms of corporations, um, it would seem to me that it for in order for corporate power to be reoriented, there would need to be um, a change in the law because I don't think it should be, we should be living in a world where it's left up to corporations to decide how much mm. uh, they want to dole out to, to others. Um, there, there should be I think the future will show a change in, in the law legally mm. disallowing corporations to reap in such large profits yeah. and that it, it shouldn't be left up to them. It should be yeah. a, a like national, uh, international law yeah. that can be established. Well, thanks for the qualifying comment. I mean, I was taking for granted that that, that would be part of the evolution of you know the way things would go, that there'd be those <coughs> limitations imposed by by laws, but you know, one of the disturbing things about uh, American law in particular that Al Gore underlines in his book, um, um, that white one, what's it called? Uh, an inconvenient, no, the one after that. Um, I'm sorry? No, 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 it's another one after that, but it's about American politics. He discusses how American politics. Um, has been undermined and corrupted in the last 50 years. It's a brilliant book because, and it's very disturbing because he writes just as a politician and someone who's got a good finger in the pulse of what's going on in the world. Um, so the democracy that the US stands for is pretty much tottering on one leg at the moment. Uh, and that blow that the Declaration of Independence uh, um, that, that was uh, struck for the, uh, back in 1776 uh, was a, a blow for the world, just as the French Revolution was a blow for the world in terms of democracy, free, more freedoms and so forth. Um, and so in the space of only a couple of hundred years, um, those freedoms are being diminished day by day at an, at an alarming rate. And there's more and more control by governments. All Western governments uh, have this very, um, fascist sort of sub-personality to them, if you, you, you could put it like that in a sense, in a kind of ruthlessness. Um, and um, this is part of the first ray, the, the shadow effect of the first ray as it's increasing and the Shambhala energy is increasing. We, th this is like collateral damage related to that. Yeah. So, 
I uh, wanted to expand a little bit upon what Francis was saying in that there's kind of like two different ideas out there about a new world order. Of course, most people see it as this, you know, corporate hostile takeover of all the world's nations and banks and all the kind of world banks coming together, so on and so mm -hmm. forth. But then we know esoterically there's this kind of other aspect to it. And I was almost just thinking if it's to, to truly create a, you know, resource-based economy, something that could, you know, kind of create a database of all the world's resources, how, you know, this nation has this many resources, this nation has this many resources, what are the needs of that nation, you know, you know, I think there could be algorithms and computer systems which could calculate all these mm. things, how That's much right. would need to get set around, but it would need to be a global effort. It would almost need to be a kind of centralized power that t could do this. So again, it's always the motive incentive mm. behind the power which determines the outcome. Absolutely. So it's uh, thinking if it's even possible that a, essentially a new world order could essentially manifest as something negative, but then become positive. Well, that's know? right. It's, yeah. it's almost like the, the bankers, all these people, they're playing their role unconsciously. They yeah. think they're, you know, they have their own agenda, and they, you know, but little do they know, they set this whole thing up, and then the consciousness of humanity changes, mm. and then we just end up using what they create to do exactly what sure. will fulfill the plan of God. Yeah. There was another question over here first, I think. So stands in the um, great invocation to seal the door where evil dwells. And I'm surmising from your presentation that one of the goals of World War II was to seal that door. And that did not happen. Can you comment on that, please? Yeah, I've contemplated that, that um, passage that DK talks about and that the Great Invocation has in it. And it was, in many ways, it was sealed uh, pretty much, but kind of drifted, drifted open again <laughs> uh, through humanity repeating the same old mistakes, you know, going, going to that default setting of um, materialistic thinking, perhaps, all those kind of things. So. It's not completely sealed yet, and there's such a relative thing in terms of what evil is. Uh, we could keep on sealing it for millions of years, you know, because what was, um, uh, what do they say, uh, evil is the the good you should have left behind. So it's all relative to different stages of of unfoldment. For instance, a lot of the practices for initiation in Lemuria. Uh, would be regarded as as totally uh, backward today, for the for, by the hierarchy. Kathy, <coughs> sorry, she got in before you. It's interesting to contemplate how this new international economic order will come about, but the Tibetan does state that a group of fourth degree initiates will come forth along the economic line, and they will assume control of the resources of the planet and distribute them equitably to all the nations of the world. So, oh. What book is that one in? I think it's in Externalization. And yeah, is that the same book, the same book that uh, has the passage about the, the adjuster of finances who's going to come in and... Um, I'm not sure. He, I think he's talking about a master in that respect. Mm. There was a question down here from Maria Christina. If you could bring the mic up. It's more a comment than a question. Um, the idea expressed by Justin is something to be held by, by groups for the next step. But um, in 2008, in a meeting in Brazil, the 20G 20, the 20 group, mm -hmm. G20. Uh, the, that moment, the minister from England talked about this. Oh, so yeah. something that is already uh, precipitating. Okay. But Excellent. of course, there is going to happen a lot of opposition. Yeah. It's going to take many decades. So the esotericists need to hold the vision mm. and bring it down. Yeah, good, very good point. 
One other thing we haven't mentioned is the Occupy movement, which is yeah. very strong yeah. as well and contributing to Well, that. I got an email from Nation of Change the other day, um, which I'm subscribed to. I don't get the chance to read half the stuff anymore, but um, uh, the gist of the article, what's, what do we do next? You know, after that initial um, uh, push and um, my Scorpio newsletter for last year goes right into the Occupy and the Occupy chart, which is Scorpio Rising. Um, I learned a lot about, about that movement just by, by writing that. Um, I don't know, but it was a very encouraging sign. We haven't seen anything like that since the 60s in the Vietnam demonstrations. So um, I'm hoping that 2012 has a lot more uh, uprising by the um, general populace who's, who are going to say we're not going to take it anymore and we'll hold people to account. Of course, this is going a bit extreme in some areas. You know, there was this um, David Wilcock guy and a few other people wanting to go around and arrest the, the boogeymen. You know, it's turned to a ridiculous farce. But um, uh, so I think things are on the right track, but the momentum cannot be lost at the moment. We can't lose momentum on this. And we're already, what, almost five months into 2012. So, um, you know, of course, the police have clamped down quite dr in quite draconic ways on, on all the protesters, you know, arresting them and clearing all the sites and all the rest of it all around the world. So, um, you know, each time they're going to raise the, the protesters are going to raise their game, is it going to get more and more violent or is it going to, uh, are there going to be some innovative ways to get around that without, the, without that kind of conflict? And it all comes down to money too, of what, what the protests themselves, who, who are the 99% who don't have that much money, um, and how they can get together and be effective with, uh, with these cultural changes. So I can't really answer that question. <laughs> but uh, one more question, Kathy, and we'll call it a day. Well, one, one encouraging um, planetary alignment, I think, that Oh, could precipitate right. a more rapid change is the Pluto Uranus square, which some are saying is really a culmination of the conjunction in 65, 66. That mm -hmm. this is really one of the major shift periods, yes. and so therefore, I don't think it necessarily will take decades. I don't think we have decades. Mm, that's a very good point, and, and I hope so because the the squares between Uranus and Pluto continue between to, to 2015, so we've got a few years up our sleeve, and indeed we could see some, some major turmoil in the next few years because the entrenched um, you know, crystallization and all the rest of it and the, the lack of change that I mentioned before, is, is, it's not going to change easily um, as, the, as, as they, they're going to be forced to change their old patterns. So, um, you know, the, the worst with Uranus square Pluto, it, it can be major revolution and insurrection, lawlessness, breakdown of law completely, um, you know, torching cities. And we saw some of this in the last couple of years in, in Britain particularly and, and Europe. And uh, they are more proactive in terms of, of really doing those kind of demonstrations than, than here in the States. So we might see it start there and um, we d yeah, but but it, it it probably will, it probably will uh, get get violent again. I think. Just a comment. Just a comment on that. The children born with that conjunction are now in positions of power. The children born in the sixties with the 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 Uranus Pluto conjunction. This is their this is their time. Exactly. Yeah. So. You think of our relationship from Occupy, Occupy Wall Street. Occupy movement to evolve, so they're calling it Evolve Santa Barbara, holding it kind of more positively. Yeah. That's very Santa Barbara. It is, <laughs> but it, it also happened in Tucson as well. Yeah, um, a, a good friend of mine is kind of yeah. leading that, and yeah, many people are coming together. Okay. So. Okay. Well, we've just about um, exhausted the the time available. So, thanks everyone for coming, and. Um, yeah.